Worldwide, researchers and industry leaders are improving health outcomes for patients by utilizing the multifunctional efficacy of regulatory T cells to develop novel therapies and disease treatments. Regulatory T cells, commonly referred to as Tregs, play a critical role in maintaining order in the human immune system by regulating and suppressing excessive inflammation. Given the therapeutic potential of Tregs for patients with autoimmune diseases, cancer, and organ transplants, both researchers and industry leaders are developing novel therapies that utilize the multifunctional efficacy of Treg cells and disease treatments to improve health outcomes for patients. A scientific leader in Treg function and clinical applications, Dr. Chichir Tong is the professor and director at the Transplantation Research Lab in the Department of Surgery at the University of California, San Francisco. The Tong Lab focuses on translating knowledge on the mechanisms of immune intolerance into novel therapeutics for treating autoimmune disease, diabetes, and preventing transplant rejection. Currently, two major areas of her work are focused on the therapeutic application of regulatory T-cell therapy in type 1 diabetes and transplant rejection, or GVHD. In this presentation, she shares the latest research conducted by her lab using Treg cells for therapy, the benefits of these therapies, and explores a technical challenge of commercializing Treg therapies that require new approaches in manufacturing and regulatory review. A copy of her presentation will be available for download on the Invitria website. So, so why do we work on regulatory T cells? And then it's because if you don't have these cells, and actually the, it's a human disease, and then and these young boys actually have a, uh, can have fatal autoimmune diseases. And then that tells us regulatory T cells is critical for immune homeostasis. And then they are really the master regulator, uh, regulator of uh, immune um, homeostasis. And then it's because of their, their, their quality list in blue on the uh, left side, is that they have dominance over other cells and then they also can adapt to different kind of a condition. Um, and then they persist a long time. They actually, once the inflammation is controlled, they also have the ability to promote tissue repair. So this kind of a multifaceted uh, therapeutic effect is really difficult to recapitulate using a single drug or a combination of drugs. That's why we think that regulatory T cell themselves can be a ther uh, therapy. And then first we need a protocol to grow these cells. And so this is what we call the generation 1.0 uh, polyclonal Tregs. And our manufacturing work stream is slightly different from most of other people have used uh, for clinical manufacturing. We start with blood product, either whole blood or leukophoresis. And then, um, and then we actually purify regulatory T cells using FACS. And we use three markers, CD4, CD25, and CD127. And then this will allow us to maximally isolate the regulatory T cells with highest degree of precision and purity to enter into the manufacturing stream. Uh, stream. And our expansion protocol uh, depends on the use of anti-CD3, anti-CD28 coupled beads and we give two rounds of stimulation, nine days apart, and then feeding with IO2 and fresh media in between. And then with this, and you will see that we get, uh, um, on average, about 500-fold expansion in two weeks, in 14 days, okay? And the, I want to emphasize, actually, the, the, the fax purification we use, um, which is, critical, I think, to, to our success. As you can see, that the, most of the Treg we produce remain to be regulatory T cells at the end um, that are high in FOXP3 and have a demethylated uh, FOXP3 enhancer region is because of the high purity of the cells we use. If you don't purify the cells, the conventional T cells and non-regulatory T cells actually grow much faster than regulatory T cells and they take over the culture. Um, so with this um, particular protocol, the polyclonal expansion protocol, we have uh, embarked on or are embarking on uh, five different clinical or five different patient populations and six different clinical trials in type 1 diabetes, cutaneous lupus, pemphigus, and kidney transplantation and islet transplantation. OK. 
Okay. Here are some data that's published already um, that, first of all, we found that if you expand regulatory T cells in vitro uh, using this protocol, you actually can repair some of the regulatory defect. One of the criticism or, or concerns with this technology is if you want to treat autoimmune disease using regulatory T cells and you isolate these autologous T Rex from the patients, their T Rex may be defective so that you won't be able to, um, the, the cells will not have the therapeutic function you're looking for. But at least for type 1 diabetes, we know that's true uh, in that if you look at the control, I don't know, do I have a ability to point? Can you see my point? Uh, so if you look at the control here, this is looking at CD, uh, IO2 signaling, uh, fossil step five, and then if you give IL-2, the control T-Rex have high level of step 5 phosphorylation and IL-2 signaling, whereas the type 1 diabetes has low level of uh, signaling compared to the controls. After expansion, they're at the same level. And so the in vitro expansion cure, uh, corrected this uh, defect, and then the cells are robustly uh, maintained the FOXP3 uh, T-Reg phenotype with high CD25, high CTI4, and a high lab expression, and then they're more suppressive, right? The black bars can suppress as you dilute them out, whereas the gray bars are before expansion, they uh, lose their suppressive function sooner. So these cells after infusion um, can be tracked uh, using deuterium. This is because during the ex vivo expansion, our media contained deuterated glucose. That get incorporated inside the cell into the genomic DNA, actually. And then we can isolate the genomic DNA from peripheral blood uh, cells and then uh, measure the deuterium. This allows us to do two things. So one is to follow the Tregs and to see when do they peak or how long do they last, uh, specifically the infused Tregs. Another thing it can do, as I'm going to show you on the um, right side of the slide, is, uh, is that it will allow us to track the stability of the cells to see if they change into other cell types. So at least for the, the kinetics, what we observed is that uh, the cells peaked in the first two weeks after infusion. But then there's a very dramatic uh, drop uh, from the peak in the first three months. After three months, they stabilized and then stayed and then can be detected as late as one year, as long as one year. The uh, last follow-up we did was a patient. It was one year after infusion. And then in all patients, we could detect the regulatory T cells. So they tell us two things. And then first of all, the cells actually lasted much longer than we actually expected. But the, 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 we wonder why it has this a sharp drop from two weeks to three months. And then uh, whether it's redistribution of the regulatory T cells or some regulatory T cell died, and then uh, they cannot be, uh, um, uh, they did not persist. So that remains to be um, investigated. And so on this side of the slide, I'm showing you the stability of these cells. So what we can do here is we can sort the regulatory T cells or we can sort the non-regulatory T cells and then partition them into different uh, um, subsets and ask where, do, uh, where does deuterium reside? As you can see here, um, this is different color, it's different time, and all the deuterium that can be detected are in the t red compartment and then not in any of the other compartment throughout the one year period. So this suggests to us that the regulatory T cell we infuse remain to be regulatory T cells and then they're phenotypically and then stable. Um, what about the diabetes disease itself? And then in this particular trial, we enrolled four cohorts that received uh, five million, um, um, five million and then 40 million, 320 million and 2.6 billion T Rex. Um, it's three to four patients per group, so it's not aimed to establish any efficacy. Um, but from this cohort, what we can see is actually C-peptide is a measurement of a beta cell function in these patients, uh, remained fairly stable during, our, uh, during the entire trial period. Um, 
so we also use this protocol, this uh, polyclonal T-Rex to treat um, kidney transplant patients. For this particular patient population, and then we have designed a trial to pre-select patients who have inflammation in their biopsy. And then the, these patients, um, kidney transplant patients at UCSF routinely get a six months biopsy to assess their graft uh, function and graft infiltration. infiltration. About 20% of patients will have these, what we call the subclinical inflammation. Their serum creatinine is normal, but their biopsy don't look normal. And then this gives us an opportunity to treat the patient population um, with experimental therapies. And then in this partic particular case, it's a polyclonal T-Rex because there's no established guideline how to treat this subclinical inflammation. So our intent is actually to conduct a big trial of uh, polyclonal regulatory T-cell therapy, but before we did that, we want to determine the feasibility of this approach. Uh, since these patients are received a, a kidney transplantation or on immunosuppression, are usually much older and than the type 1 diabetes we have experience with. So we enrolled three patients. Uh, here's their age and their uh, cause of uh, kidney disease and also their um, enrollment uh, biopsy. All have some degree of uh, inflammation as indicated by these uh, numbers here. They all received about 320 million regulatory T cells, polyclonal regulatory T cells. And the first question we asked is uh, if these cells uh, would persist as we have observed in type 1 diabetes patient because then again these patients are on immunosuppression and particularly calcineurin inhibitor we know are detrimental for regulatory T cells. And so the colored lines here are from these kidney transplant patients and then the blue lines are the type 1 diabetes patient who received the same dose of uh, regulatory T cells, 320 million. And as you can see, the pattern here is almost superimposable. So we are delighted to, uh, to see this result and that at least at this time point, six months after kidney transplantation on that dose of immunosuppression and the regulatory T cells we manufacture can uh, persist in this patient as in the non-immunosuppressed type 1 diabetes patients. And moreover, we did not see destabilization as shown on this side. Again, here the black dots are Tregs and the open symbols are subsets of T-conventional cells. And then we don't see deuterium signal among T-conventional cells and only see them in the regulatory T cells. So that's reassuring. In terms of their, their inflammation, because of this trial design, and we can go back and re-biopsy the patient and actually have a quick readout of the efficacy. And quite like the, the, the skin story I'm telling you um, that allow us to have some uh, quick biomarker of a potential efficacy or uh, safety. So here's our three subject enrolled and then um, the first subject was our best subject. Uh, repeat biopsy two weeks after infusion and the inflammation was nearly completely gone. And then this reduction in inflammation was observed at six months. Um, after the Treg infusion. The seven, second subject um, also showed reduction, but more gradual reduction of uh, inflammatory infiltrate. The blue uh, numbers, by the way, are the, the CD45 positive cells per biopsy. Um, the third subject did not respond, actually had showed increase in the inflammatory cell load. We can also actually monitor the effect in the urine because um, the, the patient only have one, this one transplant kidney producing urine and all the metabolites and then potential inflammatory markers actually can uh, drain into the urine. And if you measure urine uh, chemokine, which is a marker of uh, rejection and inflammation, and then they were high before Treg infusion and universally reduced um, after the Treg infusion. So it suggests that the T-Rex, uh, infusing T-Rex in people with inflammation uh, in, um, that did not cause exacerbation of the disease 
and then they potentially it may have some uh, effect in reducing inflammation. So that's our experience with the polyclonal T-Rex. From preclinical models, we know that antigen-specific T-Rex has much higher potency um, against organ-specific diseases, be it the transplant or islet uh, in type 1 diabetes. So we then developed this um, manufacturing process to manufacture donor alloantigen-specific uh, T-Rex for transplant indications. So this process start the same way of using facts to purify regulatory T cells, but instead of using bead at a, as a primary stimulation, we use donor-derived activated B cells. And then it's very much like a mixed lymphocyte reaction. You mix these uh, activated B cells together with purified T-Rex and then feed with IO2. And then this is a, about 11 days, the cells will expand and come to a rest. And then we give another round of stimulation with anti-CD3, anti-CD28 beads and to increase their number. And the end product uh, I'm going to show you in the next slide are donor and alloantigen specific, but they're polyclonal as uh, depicted here. They are enriched for alloantigen or highly purified for alloantigen specific T cells, but polyclonal in nature. And then here's the, the expansion um, of these uh, donor alloantigen specific cells. This is our actually qualification runs um, when we sub before the submission of our drug master file. Um, uh, in reality, in when we actually entered into patient populations, this become highly, highly variable. Um, in terms of the quality or identity of the uh, T-Rex after expansion, they remain to be demethylated at the FOXP3 enhancer region, so that's good. They s remain to be T-Rex. Here's their suppressive, donor-specific suppressor activity. And as you dilute out these regulatory T-cells, and they remain to be highly suppressive, if you use polyclonal T-Rex, and they quickly lose their activity. And the same is true here, that if you stimulate it with donor versus third party, suggesting these cells are indeed uh, very specific for donor and, uh, and highly potent at suppressing donor-specific response. This is at one to uh, over 100 dilution of the regulatory T cells. So with this product, uh, we have, um, um, we're um, conducting four different clinical trials, two in kidney and two in liver. And then these trials are ongoing, so I'm not going to go into these trial details um, for this talk. So the challenges uh, with this uh, platform, and there are many of them, and I circle some of them here. For example, the fax purification is really our bottleneck. We cannot process more than one unit of blood. And then this is already using two fax sorters and then sorting uh, for, what, 10? 12 hours, uh, back, two, two sorters si uh, sorting simultaneously. And then re really is not only the limit of our team to work uh, nonstop for about 20 hours, but this I think is also limit of the cells, because as you're sorting, they're sitting at room temperature, and then that's also stressful for the cells. So um, another um, challenge is actually the use of the beads. And we do two rounds of stimulation, so we got to have the precise count of the cells and adding the right number of bead to cell ratio. And then we also have to count during the re-stimulation to make sure we have the right ratio to re-stimulate. At the end of the expansion, these beads need to be removed. It's actually very labor intensive. So our biggest day of the expansion is a, it's, it's actually the day zero, and then day of harvest, and then day of re-stimulation. So if we can actually get rid of these bees, it will make our life a whole lot easier. And then the challenge, as I alluded to in the last slide, is this high variability in the expansion. So one of the um, approach we have taken it's really a serendipitous discovery by a postdoctoral fellow in the lab. It's actually we end up developing a bead-free protocol um, that 
without a beat and then without the need of restimulation, it's basically, it's quite simple. You give a beat-free cocktail at the beginning of the expansion. So here's the expansion characteristics of uh, multiple uh, donors and then beat-free expansion versus the beat stimulation. And then the beat stimulation here is only one stimulation because the beat-free protocol is only one stimulation. The one thing I think it doesn't really show up very well because this is on the log scale is that the, the beat stimulation actually take off much faster than the beat-free protocol. And then the beat-free protocol is slow to start, but they're more persistent. And then, in fact, our early experience, we stopped the experiment at day nine. Um, that's only, the cells are only halfway done or less than halfway done their expansion. They peaked actually day 16, 17 after the initial stimulation. And this is a more dramatic uh, demonstration of uh, the effect of the bead uh, protocol on day nine, you can see the cells are all come to a rest, whereas the beat free protocol are still going. And then um, very strongly aggregated. And then, the, so we think this beat free protocol may be um, a, a much better alternative for automated production um, and more robust and reliable production of uh, polyclonal Tregs. All right. Um, so with that, I'd like to summarize and then just to say that, you know, we have uh, um, really the regulatory T cell therapy start to take off and then they are, uh, we show that this is feasible and then they're, I think, collectively in the field, more than 100 p patients, I think in there, more than 200 patients have been infused with regulatory T cells. We have infused more than 50 here at UCSF. And then um, they're well tolerated and then um, um, seems to be rather safe and harmless. And then, the, um, and then the cells can persist for a long time. And then there may be some hint of a favorable biomarkers after regulatory T cell infusion. So uh, the challenge I think in, in, in this is uh, in regulatory T cell therapy is how do we design trials to um, read out efficacy and to see if this is a technology and then therapeutic platform worth pursuing. But here on this side, I list other challenges and mostly related to manufacturing since we're gonna work on this together. Uh, one is this highly variable um, expansion that um, especially in patient, in disease patient um, that we want to target. And this sharp drop of infused regulatory T cells on um, they, um, in the first three months, is interesting. I wonder if it has something related to the biology of the regulatory T cell we expand. We feed them, we stimulate them uh, very strongly in vitro, and then perhaps that may impair their persistence in vivo. And the manufacturing workflow is extremely labor intensive and ex extremely expensive. And then it really needs to be changed and need to be automated to make it uh, um, a, a therapeutic platform that can be um, sustainable. And what I did not touch upon and something else we're struggling is that this cryopreservation impairs the raw material and then possibly impair the product itself. So that's another area we need to develop. 